All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Chanel Ward, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Take Two Interactive. Um, I want to welcome you to the Grills Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Gaming Roundtable presented by Take Two. So I want to get into this discussion. We're going to get right into it and bring out and introduce our panelists, right? We're eager for this conversation. Uh, first, we have Gordon Bellamy, founder of Gay Gaming Professionals. Hi, Gordon. It's a pleasure Hello. to see thank, you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Then we have Jim Huntley. Uh, Jim is professor and head of marketing at USC Games. Hi, Jim. Hello. How's it going? Glad to be here. Awesome. Uh, Layla Shabir, founder of Girls Make Games. Hi, Layla. Hi. It's great to be here. Awesome. Uh, Susanna Pollock, president of Games for Change. Hi, Susanna. And then last but certainly not least, we have Janina uh, Gavinkar, filmmaker, actor, and consultant, gaming consultant, that is. Right? Ah. Great. So it is so fantastic to be in company to spend some time today. I want to hop right into it. And I want to kind of frame this conversation around um, the evolution of interactive entertainment, right? How has it evolved over the past 40 years from being born, right, as we all know, out of the toy industry to becoming today's most popular and successful form of entertainment around the world? Here's the question. What do we want to demystify about gaming, the industry at large, and its transferability? It's, it's interesting, Chanel, that you said it was born out of the toy industry because I come into it out of the television industry. And for me, what attracted me to the game sector was the fact that I, I saw games as a platform for storytelling in the 21st century. Like it is the platform for storytelling. So so yes, it's a toy. Yes, it's an interactive experience, but it's also such a strong platform for telling incredible, immersive and important stories. Um, and I just wanted to get that out there. Absolutely, and I, I'm coming from the other direction. I did come from the toy industry, even though I've been a gamer all my life. I worked at Mattel before coming to THQ. Um, and we all remember playing with action figures and dolls and you know, tabletop games when we were a kid and building these stories around what we were doing physically. And we all remember Saturday morning cartoons and to me gaming is basically the marriage of those two things. Uh, it's, it's a way to give uh, a player or a child at uh, agency to be able to have an interactive experience. It feels like unique to themselves, but also to have fun with toys that are laid out and play, uh, play with other people and play with cool things that you can see on your TV screen. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? I think for me, Definitely gaming used to be something that I played as a child. So it's interesting. I wanted to talk about how for me, there was a huge jump. I played games, my Atari 2600. It was part of the big pile of toys that I had. And then fast forward like 20 something years, I haven't played a game since. And, and the medium had evolved so much that it was almost unrecognizable. Um, and that was sort of like the pull for me coming in being like, it's almost like magic when you and you see it after such a long time, there were these tiny pixels on the screen and now it's these rich immersive worlds, these stories that are you know influencing not just people playing them, but society at large. And I think that's what's most compelling to me um, about the games industry, how impactful it is. Ms. Shabir, we must have had very different parents because I did not, nor was I allowed to have any sort of gaming in my childhood <laughs> at all. <laughs> But uh, in terms of demystifying it for the next generation, right? Um, I think there's a, there's a few things that we really need to let everybody know. One, you don't need to be able to code to be incredibly valuable to the games industry. Um, two, you don't need to be a dude, for sure. That's for sure. There's so much space for you. I promise you, you will find it. And um, what else? Three, games don't just exist on consoles, right? So uh, if you have somebody in your life, if you're watching this panel, you're probably interested in the games industry already. Uh, I wanna urge you to see even more space for yourself in the world of mobile games, in the world of, uh, I mean, there's just so, VR, literally so many things and they don't just live on consoles. Um, and there's also beautiful stories being told in the mobile space as well, in the indie mobile space specifically. Yeah. Forest, for yeah. example. I'll just jump in. I think um, <laughs> a way that games have evolved is, is where the conversation is centered. Um, when I was coming up, 
games, whether they be video games or, or board games or even television, were around um, a set of shared rules that were externally created. And we would all choose to jump into those worlds together for a certain amount of time and follow those rules. Um, today, um, the ownership of that rule set and of those identities has been democratized, where I and you and you and you bring so much of yourself to a game, whether it be through the character you create, through the device that you play it on, um, through the stories that you tell, through your play. And so today, I think, especially for young people coming into games, um, it is as much a form of expression as it is a form of like shared experience and play. So when I think about like back in the day, like hopscotch, patty cake, whatever you played as kids, Foursquare, it, it was about the game and the rules. It wasn't as much ugh, like, let me bring myself to you and share myself with you across these devices, playing, talking, customizing, communicating. And so I think games, like what it even means to young people is very different than maybe what it means to some of us who came along in the past millennium. I want to add to that just a little bit because Layla also said something about um, it, games are no longer just consoles, right? And games are, you can play it across multiple devices, whether it's pan, you know, whether it's mobile, it's on your PC, but games are also not just for young people and that the average age of the gamer is is aging up and the entertainment software association you know produces their essential facts and i may get it wrong but but you have um i think the average age of a, a gamer is 33 or 34 right now and nearly 46 percent of them are women so you have a form of media that is reaching audiences mm -hmm. of all different ages from different backgrounds and around the world so it re truly has become this ubiquitous form of of media um, that serves so many different audiences. And I think that's really important to remember. I think I just have a funny anecdote about my parents. They're from Pakistan. And the first time I told them that I joined the games industry, they were just like, you're throwing like your MIT degree <laughs> away. Like you're just gonna be making, what? Like that's nonsense. And fast forward a few years, um, they were visiting when Pokemon Go came out and they saw everyone outside because because they had the same stereotype of like gamers just you know mm. mom's basement and mm. you know what i was doing i was stuck to my computer for a long time but with pokemon go we all went out and they caught and they called them pokemon <laughs> <laughs> we all went out and, and we had a word back the definition of what a video game is just keeps evolving and i think that's such a that's such a beauty of it and i feel so fortunate to have found this little club that we're a part of um, so yeah, I think a lot of things that need to be demystified, but one of those, one of those huge ones is, you know, you have no idea what's going on. That's a great yeah. one to jump on because uh, that's the other thing we want to demystify. You can learn how to do this in a school. Oh wait, which school? There, oh, there we go. Um, so you know, we we have the number. You know, USC has the number one games program. We've been number one for almost the full last fifteen years. The Princeton Review rating. So. When we talked to when I talked to parents about, hey, your your son or daughter may want to consider our program, they're like, you can you can learn games in college. Like, yeah, no, there's a whole we have degrees, there's three six figure jobs. Take two interactive, I'm sure would hire some really great talented people. And what we're looking for is more diversity. We want more voices, we want more variation, we want new stories that we can talk talk about. Well, yeah, uh, the, the value chain has changed. So going yeah. once again back to games as we played them growing up, I thought all games were made by Milton Bradley. Okay, that was, that's who made games. And no, so I didn't self-identify, mm -hmm. right, as someone who could author or own, right? I could only consume. I can consume games. I love to play games, right? You see the work that Leo's doing. It literally says right there. It's in the name. Girls make games. That is meaningful. Okay, that is powerful, you know, as far as what it could mean to parents, to families. The work Susanna's been doing forever Obviously, Jim, there at USC, super excited about the Lawson Fund. I hope you're going to talk about that too. Everybody yeah. involved, but like moving people up the chain from consumption to ownership is something that has happened that needs to be demystified about games, right? That games can be owned, games can be created, games can be distributed, not just played. And right. thus, perhaps to parents of the future, you know, a different relationship with what games could mean to their children. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to our second question. Thank you for your robust responses for our opening question. Question number two, 
what does diversity and inclusion in our industry require us to consider beyond representation, right? Beyond having diverse candidates and creators, what else does it ask us to consider? The first thing we need to look at as D and I, which are two very popular letters of the alphabet right now, but they mean diversity and inclusion. You gotta include the people that you're inviting to this party. It's just gonna make more things dope. And you know, the other thing is we have to all ask ourselves what representation really means. I think something that happens a lot in the last few years is that it sort of stops at the faces on screen. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you are a person who has been othered your whole life for various reasons, you might see a character that looks like you, but then they start talking and you can tell that they are not being written for or produced or supported by people like you. And it is a very strange emotional uncanny valley that happens and um, it is not sustainable. So representation has to extend past those faces or face scans or whatever you wanna say that are on screen. It's just got to be more. But by the way, it's happening. So mm -hmm. much has changed. It is We are in an incredible place compared to where we were even five years ago, but we ain't there yet. So that means, and, and like everybody's in on it. It's not like people are like, oh no, we want to keep the things the way they were. No, everybody's here to make better stories, better games, better experiences, but it is going to take time and it's going to take people having the courage to speak up. So just do it, have the courage to speak up. And if you do it with some compassion in your heart, knowing that we are in the generation that gets to change things, which is very exciting, then people will receive it with a hug, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say something that's changed in the changing in language is the word belonging has been added. And to me, belonging, it's like this panel, right? Any one of us could be included in the grill, in some panel, because we're all outstanding in our own ways. Belonging is when you're able to include others, right? Chanel, you bringing us together to have a talk is what the real change is. We've all been on panels before all our lives, 20 years, 25 years, right? But this conversation is belonging, which is a different, Thing. And that's something throughout media, we've all been in rooms. You, you were just talking about it. You talked your way in a room, you didn't feel like you belong there. But isn't it better when it's your room and you decide who's in there, who gets a coffee, who gets a croissant, right? That is what is transformative, right? You get to open and close the door, come on in. Until then, right, it is uh, diversity is observed versus diversity is empowered, which are two really, you, you know it, you were just talking about it. You know it when you feel it, right? When this is like, oh, look, let me observe you. Representation. Right. And it might get flipped off in a second. <laughs> it's very different <laughs> than empowered uh, belonging. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, mm -hmm. oh, go, go ahead, Jim. No, no, please go for it, Susanna. Uh, well, I was gonna say that, um, there's also a, a like a, a a lever that needs to be shifted or a different mindset, and that you know, first of all, I believe I, I agree everything you said about belonging. I think that's really really important. That that which also a, a brings a lot of people to playing games, right? Is that sense of belonging and having community and being part of a culture and being able to identify and uh, create self identity in that environment. But there's also recognition that there's a diversification of audiences that are driving this huge economic industry and they have value and um, and games can be created and recognized for those people who are making decisions whether to buy or not buy a game. And there's power in that. Um, I recently was talking to Mark Barlet, who is the uh, uh, CEO of Able Gamers, which charity, which which represents people with disabilities, and he said for for him a big turning point with him in the industry was the fact that he was able to articulate that 46 million Americans have some kind of disability, 
Yeah. And these are people who self-identify as gamers. They over-index as gamers because it's a place where they can find that belonging, that sense of belonging. And they have purchasing power. And there needs to be changes, and there are being changes in terms of accessibility in gaming. But that's something to, you know, that's a card that we all hold on to. And I think, you know, you know, I don't know if it's a skeptic in me, but can be a, a, a real driver for making change oh, in the yeah. industry. For sure. It's like, it's like if you want to be an altruist, you can say this is just the right thing to do. And if you want to be an asshole and be fully about your capitalism, you can be like, new buyers, duh. Why is this just, it just makes sense? Be? Same yeah, right. outcome. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you spoke a bit about, about the uncanny valley, and I think there's an uncanny valley which exists um, in most contexts uh, for diversity, which is uh, from when you can count, and by that I mean like until when you can't. So, for example, Susanna runs Games for Change, and if I was like for gender equity, how many speakers do not identify as male at Games for Change? I can no longer count them. Right? right, I can't count them because it is, it's it's in the batter. But before it, it, other conferences, you'd be like, oh, one, two, three, four, and at some point there is this uncanny valley which you have to cross. Right? Yeah, you know, I don't know how many girls and girls make games. Well, I hope all of them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, but I'm sure in the past there have been games programs where you're like, we've got three young ladies or. <laughs> Or the best, 14, the, the, the right? thing that excites because, me, the thing yeah. that excites me the most about this little part of this conversation right. is that all of us are so old. We are all talking in such binary gender language right now. In mm -hmm. about two minutes, all these kids are going to be like, "What are these? What are these girl bu bullshit? Like, <laughs> who cares? We don't care. It's so it's changing so quickly, and it's really exciting." because it's just going to grow the industry and it's gonna give us more experiences. Right. Thank you. Exactly. So I, I want to, and Layla, this was kind of divine. I, I have another question I wanna start with you and then I wanna make sure that Jim gets some airtime because I feel like there were some moments. Sure. So um, what stories should we be telling? What stories are we not telling that we may or may not be ready to hear? So I'm not sure about ready to hear or not, but I know for sure the stories that we tell, the stories that come out of our summer camps, for example, we run summer camps for kids ages eight through 18. So these are essentially young girls who, like we were talking about, you know, being the only girl in the room for them, it's been their whole experience so far. They're 15, 16, 18. And when they come to camp for the first time, this is the one place where they look around and they feel validated because people look like themselves. So I think the stories that we need to tell are the stories these kids are telling. Like Janina pointed out, you know, gender, what gender? <laughs> what, I mean, what girls, boys? The stories these kids are coming up, uh, coming up with are stories we haven't imagined because we haven't lived those lives. And I think what, the only way we can get to those stories is to empower these kids and the next generation with the right tools to be able to build the games and to express themselves in that way. Um, I wanted to, you know, touch a little bit on the representation point. I think it's really important to think about rooms, like Janina mentioned, rooms where decisions are being made. If we have diverse people, if we have true representation, and we're not talking gender, sexual, we're talking like economic class, we're talking people who play or don't play games, people who identify as gamers or non-gamers. I mean, one of the things that I'm really big advocate for is getting people who don't identify as gamers to come join the industry and help us build it because gaming is not just for people who identify as gamers. Video right. games impact us whether we play them or not. You know, believe it or not, whether we play them or not, they're gonna impact us because they're building the society we live in. They're building the future that we live in. So the stories that we need to tell are going to unfold in a way that I personally can't anticipate because every year at the end of camp, we read the game summaries that the kids come up with. And I'm sure Susanna has had a similar experience where she's just like, how are the kids thinking of this stuff? You know, when I was 10, I was eating sand, you know, like at, at the desert. So um, how are these things, uh, kids thinking about climate change at this young age or thinking about, you know, with the world I wanna live in, empathy uh, that I wanna build in the player. They, they're thinking about such complex uh, topics that that we only get to realize as adults because we face them. You know, a lot of times we'll end up telling stories that we've experienced, or if we've gone through some some obstacle in our life, we're like, oh, I understand what it's like to lose a loved one because I went through that. 
But here are kids who haven't even stepped out of their homes trying to imagine what it's like to be a different person. And I think that's what's really exciting to me about giving kids that ownership um, of making their own games. So yeah, just to build on that, and I and even say part of the previous uh, questions answer, the D and the I, the middle part is the E, the equity. And that's what we're focused on in USC games is looking for solutions to solve this problem that are specific to the groups that we want to appeal to. So the challenge that we have, we, we, we've got, we've been 50% or over 50% male, uh, female and non-binary for the last decade or so. So we've been diverse before diverse was cool uh, way back in the day. So we leave, we eat, sleep and breathe this stuff uh, where we're going now is like, how do we improve our uh, racial diversity? Uh, we're in pretty good shape versus the rest of the campus and USC is in pretty good shape versus other schools around the country, but there's still room to grow when it comes to representation for black and Native American uh, gaming professionals. So that's where the Lawson Fund comes in that we started this last April in partnership with Take-Two Interactive, uh, where it's named after Gerald A. Lawson, who is a famous black engineer that created the removable game cartridge, the technology that our entire industry is built upon right now. Uh, we named it in honor of him because we really wanna focus scholarship support, financial support for black and Native American students. Because when you look at history and statistics, uh, the number, those, those demographics have stubbornly not moved up at all in the last 15 or 20 years since it's been measured. So we really wanna do our part to not only give uh, black and indigenous students a leg up and an opportunity to get into our number one ranked uh, games program, but also down the road, work our way backwards on the value chain to Gordon's point. How do we like help students in junior high and high school even open their minds to like, whoa, I can have a job doing this? I had no idea. And even further back in grade school, where saw a lot of the the inequities start to kick in in grade school because, hey, I don't have access to a computer lab. I don't have access to computer science um, instruction. I don't have access to a lot of the stuff that the more uh, tonied and 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 um, I'd say invested upon schools do. How do we fill that gap so that we can make sure those students way back in grade school have the option to even think about going down this path and then have opportunities to actually take that path and get into what, what really is STEAM. We also, we talk about games as though it's this weird, you know, thing that's away from everything else, but it's a STEAM discipline. It's it's tech and art when it's all said and done. It's probably, I would say, one of the purest expressions of STEAM because all those things have to work together to come up with a really awesome game concept that people enjoy playing. So we really want to make sure that we're helping out on the value chain leading up to our program in college age. And then also, you know, if, if we do that, we feel like the industry is primed to take those students who are highly trained and extremely engaged and focused on working in the industry and giving them job opportunities. Awesome. Susanna, am I sensing you want to add? I do. I want to build on, on what Jim was talking about because uh, we're focused a lot on reaching those middle and, and high school students, just what you're saying, about trying to get them to understand that they could become creators and not just consumers of this of, of this very popular right form of media. And working in, in mostly Title I schools, so those are schools that qualify for free or reduced lunch, we are able to... Um, demonstrate to these young people that one, they can gain skills, right? You're right about the STEAM versus STEM. Yes, they are learning early, you know, computational thinking and computer programming. But more importantly, I think, honestly, is the, the 21st century skills. They're learning how to become critical thinkers and problem solvers and, and collaborate with one another and realize that they can bring their own talents, even if it's it's uh, designing characters or it's writing scripts or coming up with music or yep. doing research on a social impact theme because they want to make a game about climate change. Yep. They yep. have something to bring to the table. And if we can inspire them at age as 10, 11, 12, and give them like an opportunity to go through a sequential program, which which we see kids participating six, seven years in a row, and then saying, oh my gosh, I could go to college for this. Like there are programs like USC, there are scholarships available to me. To me, that's, you know, that's the, uh, that's the investment, the, the long-term investment that I think is needed yeah. From support from the industry, like Take Two, they support mm -hmm. this program. These kids are getting scholarships, yeah. you know, for participating. But more, I mean, that's that's supporting everybody. Talk about pipeline development. Then mm -hmm. we're, we're we're destined to get that kind of representation in the industry. A hundred percent. That's exactly what what our focus is, and we're 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 lockstep in that regard. And it's great to see companies like Take Two to be the vanguard of investing in it. And we're looking for more industry partners to come online. Uh, and help you know put their backs into it and help move this along. Fantastic. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, I mean, you sort of talked about one of the questions that you 
you may not want, that we weren't ready to hear, right? And the industry as abstraction, right? Capitalism, right? <laughs> I think that um, when you think about the outcomes for youth, uh, there's a slider bar between cultivating value and harvesting value, simply put, right? Mm -hmm. You're either more valuable through the industry you're being cultivated, whether it be through academia, through Girls with Games, Games for Change, right? All these programs being cultivated to be industry, or you're being harvested. Like, oh, you gave me $60. Like, thank you. Thank you for your time and, and money. And it's a really challenging question, right? To ask when you look right at the people of the world, what do I want for you as an outcome? Okay, mm -hmm. that's hard, right? Um, I think a second question, which is going to be hard, is that these young people have been connected as default. So unlike us, unlike don't talk to strangers, blah, 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 they validate themselves through connection, through as many followers and likes and interactions as possible from a very, very, very young age. That is default. And so what games even mean and are to them as a, as a payoff, as a satisfying experience, it's going to be a question that older people are not going to grok in the same way ever, right? Because we didn't have a cell phone when you were 12 years old, 10 years old, whatever, forever, mm -hmm. right? You didn't have the likes of your junior high vacation, you know what I mean? Like, that's not a real thing. And so a real hard question, it will be, what will games mean to a globally connected generation of people as they come of age as adults? So I want to say, and you know, I, I believe so much of our, our social identities are social constructs. And what I'm hearing in these conversations is deconstruction, right? What are we deconstructing? You know, so what comes top of mind and, and how does, you know, innovation um, and advancement relate to deconstruction when it comes to the gaming industry? Oof, man. Oof. I would, I, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I, 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 um, one thing that, you know, we're, I love the fact that we're a young country, but we have a short memory. Uh, in 2018, Black Panther came out, and right up until 2018, everyone was wringing their hands in gaming and Hollywood and everywhere else in entertainment. I don't know, all black cast with all, I'm not sure if that's going to do well in the box office. And now we're, you know, just saw Legend of the Ten Rings. Like this, the economic opportunity, and, and Janina hit the nail on the head. I, I am a capitalist, but I'm not hardcore and I, I do believe in fettered capitalism with some controls on it um but it needs to be a, a question about uh commercial opportunity and how do we build in diversity and equity into what i used to get uh reviewed on and bonused on which is what are some objective measurable goals that we can chase and pursue and really deconstruct what normally were, were uh, evaluated by and bonused on, which is, did you drive profit? I drove profit. Did you co control your cost? Control cost. Boop, you get a bonus. Uh, how about how many people of color did you interview? We're not talking quotas. Um, a lot of people come and come to me in at USC and say, I'm looking for African-American coders, designers, whatever, but I can't find them. Like, well, what are you doing differently than what you used to, what you used to do um, before from a hiring perspective? Well, nothing. Well, there you go. So if you've done nothing to change <laughs> the pool you're hiring from and the people you're looking at to take those roles, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to talk to anyone different. So you do need to start expanding your circle of uh, from a from a from a pipeline perspective, from a talent perspective. Look at different opportunities and different audiences of people to tap into to take some of those roles and, and at least also consider just look look at your friends. Yeah. Who do right. you hang out with? Mm -hmm. Just in your daily life, get some new friends diversify yep. your life and you will find everything will diversify very quickly after just very build much. it and they will come friends um the other thing speaking of success that i wanted to um piggyback on you know i started my life in hollywood i say it with quotes because hollywood is an industry it is not a place um and and when i'm trying to sort of talk to Hollywood about the games industry, I always say it's very parallel to feature films. There are the $100 million films, there are AAA games, right? But there are those beautiful, artful, emotional, Oscar-winning films that are highly successful. We got that in games too. So 
everybody who's out there, please hear us when we say there is space for you and you don't have to be making somebody else hundreds of millions of dollars to be of value in this beautiful wow. industry. Mm -hmm. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, that's really great talking about diversifying uh, wealth and ownership versus diversifying consumption. Yeah. Right. We, everyone we talk about over index for consuming all sorts of things right. that we <laughs> don't own. Right. And so, I mean, once again, even seeing this panel, right, seeing a director and an executive and CEOs, right? Like, like Susanna, you are games for change because you change, like, you are the change you want to make because decisions have to roll <laughs> down from your office, right? I they guess, the same yeah. thing. They, thank gosh, right? There is someone who does not identify as male running Girls Make Games. That itself, right, is, is the change. People seeing that they can aspire to run things helps them make smaller decisions in their own lives. Right which are freedom, right? Which is what true diversity, equity, belonging looks like when you are free, right? To do things and someone isn't telling you what to do, when to do it. Cause that business model, we know how that ends up. That's been tried. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. And so it is really just so important. Like the programs that all of you are putting in place, right? To empower mm -hmm. young people to know that they can decide that they can lead, right? That they can own and create these positive experiences or negative, heck, create a negative experience, create what you want. If you're free, like, right? Like every movie's not gonna be Black Panther. That there, are plenty be black of <laughs> there are plenty of mediocre artists doing mediocre work that are getting a hell of a platform. <laughs> you have the courage to make something mediocre too. Yeah, yeah. That's right. a success. That's well, I think really we are in this journey here here's something to demystify about the industry i think and this is uh, across the board i feel and have observed that uh marginalized candidates only apply for jobs for which they are overqualified and if they check every single box then they will consider applying for it but that is a myth you would be surprised there's this thing it's called learning on the job it's very popular in overrepresented populations <laughs> where they will get the job and then just be in the spot and they'll be like, oh, there's training and this and that, and I'll just <laughs> figure it out whilst in the ecosystem because of culture fit, right? I'm a good team player. I can, you know, I'm, I'm additive. And I think that the earlier age that we could transform that perception that you have to be exceptional before you get in the door to even participate, right? That you gotta kick a home run before you even swing your foot at the ball, right? That is gonna be like the healthier future um, because we can't survive on exceptionalism, right? We can't, you know, that's, that's just what it sounds like. We need to build a culture of respect and value, right? Where everyone sees themselves as valuable coming in the door and then they add their nuance and traits and you know so on and so forth that's I, i've been in those meetings yeah. where usually i'm the, i joke and say my entire career where i've been the only black guy in the boardroom but i would walk into those meetings and and you know fortune 500 companies and i would have exactly what gordon said the skills and the training and the experience specific to that com company or that industry and then i'd raise my hand and say have you ever thought about this and people go well, no, I hadn't. And you're like, okay, cool. I can't. That comes out from what makes you you as an individual and your unique point of view. Trust me when I say, come. If you can bring your unique point of view and make the company money, you've got a job for life. And if you don't want a job for life, you certainly will find investors that will fund your idea and make that something you want to do for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love I love these conversations around value add. Right. How yeah. do we continue to um, add value and in, into the spaces that we're working and designing and creating within? I want to get a sense of just, and I, I think it's really important for folks to have a sense of just how incredible games are in terms of their transferability. And Susanna, I want to come to you and ask you this question, right? How can games be used outside of entertainment, right? And Layla, I, I imagine you have some thoughts about this as well, as it relates to equity forward innovation and advancement, right? What does, what does that look like from your unique positions? 
So, I mean, the, the concept that games have a power beyond entertainment is the tenet of what Games for Change is all about. Um, you know, for almost 20 years now, we've been kind of touting that that story and trying to getting more and more people on board beyond within the games industry and, of course, outside of the games industry because the the um, the approach or the conceit that game mechanics and the attractiveness of engagement within a game lends itself very well to other disciplines, whether it's used in education, right? And it's a way to engage young people in the classroom, you know, teaching math or social studies or the critical thinking skills or, you know, difficult concepts. What a great way not only to engage kids and where they are, right? That's a big challenge that teachers have, particularly in the in this uh, COVID, you know, plus time period, right, with virtual learning. But the type of uh, learning opportunities that games provide because of the depth of them, because of the agency that, that players have, um, gives them a different environment and different relationship with the material. Then there are other other industries like the healthcare industry, or even the, I mean the not for profit space, or training that, or in in, in an industry in a, a commercial sense, where again games are a uh, a form of of engagement that allows you to have a different um, interaction with whatever the content is. We're seeing so much happening in the healthcare space; it's super exciting. Um, but also think about like social workspace or or um, or medical training where you can use these mechanics to allow people to have access to types of education and experiences that they may not have in a physical or real setting. So there's actually, again, back to the economics of it, there's an economic advantage to using games and training because you can deliver them you know, digitally through to, you know, to new employees and you can design those experiences specific to audiences that you're onboarding, right? And to, to back to your question about like, the uh, the DEI aspect to me it, it reminds me about the conversations you know I have I've got a 16 year old who's going to be taking the SATs right mm -hmm. and you've got all these issues for decades right about mm -hmm. the inequities of the SATs well think about the same the same conversations happening with AI and the same conversation ne needs to be happening about games in all these other industries it has to be considered when you're thinking about training for onboarding at at you know big box stores, right? Whether it's virtual headsets that Walmart is using, or it's training of social care workers, or it's medical training for surgeries, like all of that needs to be um, considered in you know in the design of these games that are being used outside of entertainment. Also, just the genre of using games to help mental health, right? Mm -hmm. So just that is an area that I would love 100%. to see massive growth in. If we could, if there's anyone watching, if this is an area that is important to you, get to work because we need it. Yeah. And I heard there's, a, there's a college that has a program that's focused on games and health and MFA. Oh, wait, it might be. No. Oh, we, oh. we actually have an uh, MFA in oh, games yes. health uh, for uh, within our program right now. So you hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Touching on both the things you guys said, because that's sort of for me, looking at the kids that come to camp and the games they're making, um, I almost feel like I'm able to kind of look at the future because I'm just like, okay, this is what we're going to see more of because these kids are going to grow up and become developers. Um, huge interest in using games beyond entertainment. I mean, I started my entry into the games industry was for education. I wanted to make educational games for SAT vocabulary. My games are out yet, Susanna, so your son can't use it because that was that was a killer for me, having to memorize those words. <laughs> that made no sense. Um, but same for uh, games for mental health. We've had kids, a few years ago, we had a girl come in, make a game with dolphins in it. Her, and her whole reason for making the game was her sibling um, with, I think, I believe autism loved dolphins and she wanted to make a game for him so he would you know play it and calm down and feel better we've had kids make games for their parents we had a girl come in make a game for her mom because she had just gone through a painful divorce and she just wanted to make something that she could play to recover from that they're thinking about video games as a medium they're not looking at the game itself as the end product where they you know just play it and have a great time right. there has to be something more to it and i think that's that's really that's really what we're going to start to see more and more of. And I really think that 
the the stereotype of blow them up or like button mashing and like you know the first person shooters the first fps's for me was like the stereotype that kept me out of gaming for the longest time and i know yeah. for most people that's the case that keeps their kids out of gaming and and it's still it's these are wildly popular genres but it's still not the genre that all gamers play you know for every yeah. popular game that's out there not every gamer enjoys that game i still can't get into smash it's so popular at camp the kids want me to play with it. i don't know what to do with it you know <laughs> i just can't um, you know so, i yeah. one of the one of the people i've been so lucky to be able to work with in the recent in recent years is amy hennig legend legend status yeah. for a reason mm -hmm. and she says this thing sometimes which is like why do we have to beat a game yeah. why why are we beating games that's the only option is to beat a game strange so and, and just like feature films right there are so many different genres of feature films sure okay if the studio keeps their lights on by making a big old shoot 'em up hundred million dollar movie that looks like you're playing with di joe's great fine capitalism but there are also all these studios are supporting other genres because they know their importance. Yeah, I, I think what you're all touching on are, are um, aesthetics of play, right? And so the same way in other media, you might go for learning or for collaboration, competition, of course, uh, for great story progression. Um, games uh, provide the, these bridges that people will need in parts of their lives, whether it be very personal, like around mental health, um, or spectrum, or just trying to make it through the day. Um, but also professionally, if I want to develop and move forward, I want to train, um, I want to be more connected in my workplace. I want to learn to network, right? I want to, or even keep this job for a minute before the robots come, right? And <laughs> games are going to be a part of that, right? That sort of, that sort of ordered play. Has everyone tried TikTok? Has everyone been on TikTok? Mm -hmm. Right. And what they've done is very compelling. Right. They're very compelling at serving you the next video. OK. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple thing. You can certainly see a world. Right. Where someone can serve you the next interactive experience, big or small. Right. To move you forward towards a learning goal or towards a peace of mind goal um, or towards a uh, what I think is super important is that I think because games are connected across the globe, you'll be less likely to attack someone who is from a place with whom you've played a game. Simply yeah. put, like that might be the biggest thing of all, like all the things that are like constructed by capitalism to divide us, whether it be faith, gender, nation state, race, blah, 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 blah. Games democratize that and remove those boundaries and create a shared bond unlike anything before it like in the history of ever where not only did we play the same game we actually were in the same game i love that idea and i'd love to do a research project on and really on, on looking at people's relationships around the globe and whether we all know the games are bringing people together we've seen that over the past 18 months right games have connected us games have but a, a social lifeline for people within families and also connection for meeting new people when, when you're just when you when you're unable to do that in real life um that would be a fascinating study. so i love that I'm but I, I also want to say something that i've been observing lately within my work is you know we're, we're out there and we often are working with a lot of not-for-profits museums people outside of the games industry who are interested in incorporating games in, into their into their work because as a not-for-profit that's where our focus is and I've been seeing a lot of conversations about, yes, can you, we'd like to make a game about climate change. How can we make a game about this? We want to raise awareness around this issue, or we want to attract donors, or we want to reach people in refugee camps. But what I'm also seeing a lot of is this conversation about game-like experiences that we're talking about, like one, people may call it the gamification of, of society, but, but that's not really what I'm talking about. We're not talking about creating loyalty programs. We're talking about game-like experiences that engage a consumer or engage a person in whatever you know experience or whatever moment you want to have them have a deeper relationship with, like museums. We're working with 80 museums around the country because their education departments want to create uh, game-like experiences, not even the education departments, all of them do, 
to attract a younger audience, to give them an opportunity to have a different relationship with the exhibits that they're seeing within a game-like experience, something with certain constructs around it, to give them purpose and a goal and a way to collaborate with others. And I think that is something we're gonna see more and more across our society that obviously is coming from games, from the pure board games to the games industry. And there's gonna be a lot more meshing of, of those worlds. Right. So, I, your, oh, okay, I'm sorry. so I want to, I know we have to close really shortly and I want to give, you know, provide I know. <laughs> I know for some updates. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I just want to center you all in the fantastic work that you are all doing. And we feel really privileged to, to have this space with you. So what are you most proud of as it relates to moving diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging forward, right? What are you most proud of that you're working on within your respective role and work currently? None of us can talk about these things. We live in secret. Oh, oh no. I, I'm sure. All the stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't I can't tell you anything. I, I have I have signed my life away. I, I, I will jump Should in. I get because, fired? <laughs> no. Well no, I get to collaborate with Take Two. Thank you, Take Two, as well as everyone else, and open to collaborate with everyone else. But the, the two things um that we're proudest of um is are one, our work on Twitch. To, to give voice to equity. Uh, we just had our GGP honors, which is honoring the best in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and the work, um, the positive work, which people are doing and, and treating those people who are doing the positive work like they are of value, right? And deserve time the same way people who are worthy of critique are getting lots of time, right? So I'm very proud of that. And we also have a GGP scholars program, which is for young people who do community service and are either studying to become game makers or to be content creators or work in around esports in our craft. So those are the two things that I'm, I'm proud of. Awesome. I'll, I'll go. Um, so uh, I mentioned that as a not-for-profit, you know, we're, we're out there trying to bring in more people from outside the industry into, into games and seeing how games can be used beyond entertainment. And as part of our work is to, to inspire the next generation of game designers. And that's the work that we've been doing with the Games for Change Student Challenge that has been running for seven years now. And it's a program that has just really taken off. We're seeing educators and students just loving the, loving the opportunity to bring games and game design to the classroom. So we're expanding into new cities. We work uh, you know, across from LA to New York to Detroit. We're starting in Seattle and Pittsburgh, but we're also going internationally. And through a relationship, and this is just so interesting, and through a relationship with the US State Department who sees games as a form, a, a platform for diplomacy, is allowing us to adapt this program to become a virtual exchange program with youth in other countries, in Israel, in Bahrain and Abu Dhabi. So we'll have middle schoolers in Abu Dhabi and, and Israel and Tel Aviv and Bahrain learning how to make games using our curriculum and then partnering with kids in, a, in Detroit and Atlanta and New York and creating many game studios. And yes, they're gonna make things together, but it's a platform for cultural dialogue. And the fact that games can bring kids from across the world together and create and explore and have conversations and hopefully develop lifelong you know, relationships, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Incredible. I think definitely uh, likewise for me, similar to what Susanna said, going virtual was one of those things where at first we were just like, we're just going to lose all the kids because, you know, their parents are not going to want them to sit on a computer. They've been online schooling. They're not going to go to camp, but we made it global and it ended up attracting kids from all over the world. And we had similar, you know, student exchanges from like Moldova to Argentina to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. kids joining in on the same Zoom classrooms, hanging out with kids from the US. I think it was about 79 cities around the world. And, and it's just a magical summer experience that just wrapped up and kind of the, the summaries at the end of camp where they send us, you know, what the camp experience was like for them, that they, they were all just like, I had no idea it would be this easy to become friends with someone from the US. So for the international students, because they they see kids mm -hmm. on TV and they say they think their culture is so different, but video games unite us, you know, like that you love Pokemon in Pakistan and I love Pokemon in North Carolina and we're the same people. So we can talk about the same things. And I think that's one of the, one of the beauties of video games is how much closer we all feel because of 
you know, the experience we've had in the last 18 months. We're very proud of that. Um, the other thing I'm really excited to share is that um, we have another program called the Girls Make Games Fellows, which is actually a program for students who are in game design or students who just graduated and they want to, you know, continue working in the industry. They get an opportunity to come teach at camp and also get a GDC pass and mentorship with, you know, folks like at Take Two or other game industry companies. Um, I'm really proud of being able to build that pipeline out because we start as young as eight. And so as the kids, I've actually had kids who started at eight and are now in high school because we're just, the program just turned eight. So they're in high school and now they're looking at college. So we're looking at college scholarships and potentially a scholarship fund down the line um, and obviously mentorship opportunities going forth. So we're here to build that pipeline. So if if you know of kids who are girls or non-binary and they wanna make games, send them to Girls Make Games, we'd love to welcome them. Mm, fantastic. I'd say for me, it's definitely the the Gerald A. Lawson Endowment Fund at USC, uh, green lighting that in April with Take Two and Microsoft just came on board in the last uh, few weeks as well. We're looking for more partners. Um, I it, when the the industry uh, because it's it's driven by capitalism, it reacts when there's a threat, and so when there is a crisis from a racial perspective in the country, my phone rings off the hook with people who want to help and partner. And then when things die down, the phone dies down, and the phone the calls stop coming. I would love for us to look at this as a perennial long-term initiative that we're not only doing, not only when there's a or only when there's a crisis, but also build it into our metrics and what our, our what we're uh, from a performance perspective, what we're rewarding people for from a corporate perspective. Because if that's built into your objectives from an annual basis, trust me, I can tell you as having those jobs, you will focus on making sure that happens because your personal money is dependent on you achieving that objective. So. I would love to see how we can build the loss and fund pipeline, not just into the industry, but also back and work with, um, you know, Gordon mentioned earlier, but every school on our, our, our university's campuses wants to partner with us. We are, uh, from a program perspective, we're structured or we're shared between the Viterbi School of Engineering and the Cinematic School for the Arts at uh, USC. But we work with the music school at Thornton. We work with the art school. We work with the uh, the med school, as I mentioned earlier. We also are starting to work, uh, put a big initiative together with the communication school. And then uh, the, uh, the School of Education, it's one of those things where if once someone can figure out that magic formula of training and learning with games, they're going to print money. Like the, the sector that that's going to uh, expand is going to blow up because I think we all know it's not really a secret that our public school system across the country is struggling and it's extremely uneven in terms of the resources it brings to bear, depending on the community. And gaming democratizes all of that. So we can figure out that amalgamation of, hey, I've got a fun way to educate people or educate children that they wouldn't even know that they're learning. The, you know, the sky's the limit for that. And that's that's also what's gonna help with our, our disequity, if you will. Thank you, Jim. Um, I can really quickly say that the stuff that I'm most proud of you'll see and play in the next two to five years. Um, but, um, I've been doing a lot of work in casting consultation and creative consultation uh, at some major studios and some indie studios in the last few years. And um, the work they're doing is so beautiful. And it's not just because of who is cast and who they're choosing to be in these games. Um, the change is here. <laughs> it is happening. And, um, I'm really proud to be the tiniest little part of it. Beautiful. Well, that is our time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your energy. Again, I am so thrilled to continue our partnership. We thank you for all that you do and continue to do. Um, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it.